Okay, good morning, everyone. Okay, morning, thank you. <laughs> Lone voice in the audience. Good morning and welcome. Um, welcome to Health Education Kent, Surrey and Sussex first annual conference. Uh, this year's uh, subject, patient safety and teamwork. The first thing um, I need to do um, is obviously introduce myself to people who don't know me. I'm Philippa Spicer and I'm the Managing Director of Health Education Kent, Surrey and Sussex. And I'm just going to talk you through the kind of hygiene factors before we start. So, um, it's actually quite exciting because normally we say there aren't any fire alarm practices planned, but actually there is one planned today for five o'clock. So when we're just about summarising, just before we go home at 5.15, there will be an alarm. So please don't leave the building, it is only a practice. If an alarm goes off at any other time of the day, then you need to follow the little green, or actually little white men running on the green background and they'll get us out safely to a car park. Um, if I can ask people to turn their mobile phones onto silent, uh, that would be helpful. I know everybody's very busy, but it would be helpful not to interrupt the speakers. There is filming and photography taking place, so if anybody doesn't want to be filmed or is feeling particularly shy or anything today, please do tell somebody and we'll make sure that we don't use uh, their photos or films with you in them. And for those uh, tweeters amongst you, we have a Twitter forest. So um, if you go out in the lobby, apparently it will be there for us all to see. But if you do want to tweet through the day, if you can use the hashtag, I think it's, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to sound like I know what I'm talking about. If you can use the bottom line, the at health education underscore KSS, um, and then and that hashtag, then we'll be able to collate, obviously, everything that people are saying today. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to start by setting the, the scene um, today. Actually, that's not, so wait a minute, I don't know where we're going with this. Is that... Is my presentation there? Do I have any... oh, sorry, just a moment. No. Okay, well, we'll just um, wait for my presentation to, to come up for a moment. Um, what I'll be doing is just speaking for about 15 minutes, just setting the scene and giving everybody um, really kind of the context that we're working within, both uh, national uh, HEEs in terms of, of funding and so forth, and then local, uh, what we've been doing for the last year across uh, Kent, Surrey, Sussex. Um, I might just also like to take the opportunity to point out that we do have some of our governing body members here uh, today. So we've got Darren Grayson, Chief Exec from uh, East Sussex Healthcare, sits in our governing body, and we've got Mark Devlin, who's our interim chair. So do um, you know, make the, the time to go and speak to them and ask them a bit more about how we do our business and how we make our decisions. We have lots of our heads of school here today. We have our um, postgraduate dean as well. So again, lots of opportunities to talk about the work we've been doing and you'll be meeting um, Alison Crombie uh, shortly when she does take over from me as, as chair of the event. So I've just had the thumbs up, so we'll make a start. <clears throat> I wanted to begin by reminding people or, or introducing people to our vision statement. So people that uh, may not have seen our vision statement, it is um, quite a short vision statement, and it's one that was developed for us by our stakeholders. So this included patients, public, local authorities, um, area teams, and probably most importantly, students and trainees. So we feel very um, passionate about this vision statement and everything that we do is about improving outcomes for patients. So I wanted to start by saying that everything that we think about today is on the basis of, of, of that outcome, which needs us, leads us nicely into why we've picked obviously patient safety and team working as a subject for our first conference. I don't need to go into any of these uh, sort of documents, and I'm sure you saw uh, Jeremy Hunt speaking even last week and calling Mid Staffordshire our sort of Chernobyl event. It's absolutely critical that we understand collectively how we can use education and trainer, training as a lever to improve patient safety. And that's the purpose, really, of the conversations that we want to have today with all of you. So the national picture... Just to give a few headlines, and again, I'm sure many of you know these headlines, we've got an increasing uh, feminisation in terms of medical workforce, 
But if you look at that in the context of GPs, where we're predicting a shortfall within the next, um, well, less than 10 years of 16,000, and then you look at the report that came out from the Royal College of General Practitioners last week that says that, that for the first time women have overtaken men in GP practice, we'll see that actually training the same number that we're training won't be enough because people will want more flexibility, part-time working, and it will also take people longer to train with things like you know, less than full-time training. So there's a lot, lot that we need to think about in terms of that. Um, it's also um, becoming clear that we do have people leaving the UK, UK trained doctors, nurses, therapists, leaving and particularly leaving for the English speaking countries such as America, New Zealand and Australia. So again, some reports you read suggest that more are leaving than are coming in. So it's something that we just need to think about in terms of our work of, of commissioning. I'm not going to say any more really about medical procedures and information technology because you've got some absolutely excellent speakers uh, coming on the agenda who can talk uh, far more ably than I on that subject. But we know that safer staffing levels is a real issue. We know that the Welsh Assembly are already debating whether or not to have actually, you know, uh, minimum staffing levels by law. So we need to think about that. What does that mean for the work that we do? 24-hour services, seven days a week, right across. You know, we tend to think about acute services, but we know that community and primary care, we need a, a lot of development and, um, and sort of, you know, uh, sort of infrastructure, if you like, as well, to support that through education and training. We know that there are policy levers like the Better Care Fund that's replaced the Transformation Fund, and we know that that's, that's really um, going to push forward the agenda in terms of moving things out of uh, the acute sector. And probably the one that, that we are starting to think a lot about, and I imagine a lot of you are as well, is the fact that we are one team. This is about not just integrating within the NHS, this is integrating with social care. Our patients in the community are looked after by one team, and increasingly we need to think about how we educate and train across uh, agencies as well. So in terms of funding, um, HEE has five billion pounds or there and thereabouts a year, which is great, nine and a half thousand pounds a minute spent on education and training across England. But within that, 5% or less than 5% is spent on continuing professional development, workforce development. Within that as well, 12% of the workforce is medical, and yet 60% of the training budget is spent in that area. Nurses and AHPs make up 40% of the workforce, but 35% of the, the budget is spent on them. Now, I'm not making any judgment about that, but I think it's information that we need to think about when we determine how we spend our budget and are we putting it in the right places. <clears throat> this is a slide that Ian Cumming uses, our Chief Exec of Health Education England, and some of you I know I've shared this slide with, with, with people and other people would have seen it at different events. The interesting thing about this slide is that it's taking a 10-year look at what we've done in terms of the future workforce that we have planned for, because it's on the back of workforce plans that we've worked with providers on. What has it given us? Did we expect it? Is this what we thought was happening? And I think the important um, point is, if you look at the very top line, the black one with the blue dots, the consultants, nationally grown by over 50%. If you then come down and look at where GPs are, it's significantly less, sort of around about the, the 20%. And then you look at registered nurses, and it's at the bottom. And the point that, that it, we usually try to make on this slide is to say, when you look at the economic factors or policy decisions in relation to economic factors, it's usually nursing that's the one that gets affected the most. So funding's tight, nursing gets affected. More money, we increase nursing. And it's just something, again, um, that, that we need to think about. Exploring that a bit further, the Royal College of Nursing did this um, piece of research recently, called research. Um, they looked into, by, the, by using a freedom of information request, what nursing was looking like at the moment in terms of banding. Now, we, we can debate whether it's you know, accurate or not because it is from a freedom of information request, but it's interesting, and it's interesting in the context of patient safety and the discussions that we're going to have today around multi-professional team working. Because what this shows that across England, over the last three years, which, you know, the quip years, the let's, you know, do, uh, do the same or more with, uh, with less resource, the senior nurses, the band sevens and the band eights, 
are those that have dropped off significantly in terms of, of the total. And what I would like to say to people is that, that if we look at the first slide that we shared around the consultants, we've got that huge growth in consultants, and that could be because we've got consultant-delivered services, consultant-led services, 24-hour care. But even within that, we have gaps. We have difficult to fill specialisms that, that it's not addressing. So we're growing the medical workforce, but we still have significant problems. And we always talk that it takes seven to 10 years to train a consultant and to get out of the pipeline. And I would just like to suggest that these senior experienced knowledgeable nurses, it also takes 10 years to produce. So it's really important that we are careful about what we do in terms of the total workforce and what we need to deliver service. So what are we doing in Kent, Surrey and Sussex? <coughs> well, we inherited um, a system um, that, that, that everybody did whereby we had a deanery and we had a strategic health authority. And within those functions, they were responsible for separate parts of, of the equation. But within them, we dealt with everything um, on a uni-professional silo basis. So it's quite clear that all the evidence suggests that we have to have integrated education strategies. So what we've spent the first year doing is actually developing and bringing together all our internal functions to, to ensure that we can support providers in their integrated education um, strategy because it's the only way we'll achieve service redesign. We're also making sure that everything is evidence-based and evaluated, and there's a lot of work going on that I'm sure um, Alison will be happy to talk to people about today about all the innovation and research that, that we've got sort of planned as part of our programs over the next sort of uh, a few years. And what I would also say is that our providers have asked us, you know, not to give you funding. I imagine, you know, quite a few of them have, don't give us funding that's badged so tightly around one profession that we can't use it to the best effect for the team. So give us our funding but sort of trust us to deliver what needs to be delivered through education and training to support the team for the best outcome for patients. And that's what we've tried to do um, both internally and working with, with providers. <clears throat> Just want to show this slide. This is our version of the national slide. And what this shows you is that actually we've had a more significant growth in terms of consultants than the national picture. Um, and I imagine there'll be people in the room, I've done it myself, that say, ah, oh, but we've, we've a terrible word, terrible phrase, I know, I'm sorry, but you know, we've been underdoctored in Kent, Surrey, and Sussex. We need more consultants to increase the number of training. And a lot of that is absolutely true and absolutely valid. But again, if we look at the um, GP line, sort of flatlining, when we, we know we're going to have a shortage of GPs, and we've talked about the, um, the male female split. And then we look at nursing, again, bubbling along the bottom. Now, we were quite surprised, actually, that that showed a bit of an increase. You know, even 10%, you're thinking, oh, OK, we've, we've had some increase across the bottom. So we decided to explore that a bit more across um, Kent, Surrey, and Sussex, because this is what we suspected. The growth has been in health visiting and midwifery. So actually, you then start to look at the qualified nurses, the adult nurses that we are commissioning and that are coming out each year and that are then being employed, so from ESR, we are not seeing any significant growth in nursing. So it's just, it's there, it's for information. I'm not here to make a judgment about that. What I would say is that we don't spend enough time on looking at the future workforce. So as we said earlier, if 5% or less than 5% of our budget, and we have in Kent, Surrey, and Sussex, close to 300 million pound budget, that's our section of that 5 billion, we don't spend enough time understanding the future workforce. So looking at this information, looking at the trends, looking at the data and saying, are we putting our resource where we should be putting it to get the best, if, best sort of use of it moving forward? Now, an area where I feel we have made a shift, and if you like, it's a, um, the way we should be doing it, is through our skills development strategy. So if we take our, our continuing professional development budget, the governing body made a, a decision back at the end of 2012 to actually work with stakeholders, spend some time identifying what were our priorities, how, uh, what were the kind of the, the, the big areas that we actually needed to develop the workforce across. It didn't matter uh, which part of the business you were in, and, uh, and agreed a, a program that um, are these five priorities down the middle. So. 
You wouldn't be surprised, I would hope, to see those priorities. If we look at something like dementia, we know that over the next sort of uh, 10, 15 years, we're going to increase the number of people, or the people who have dementia are going to increase by some 50%. So it makes absolute sense that we had a specific program that is led um, and you know to improve the uh, sort of you know the services for people with dementia. I'm going to go through some of these examples very briefly, but I just want to stress that the reason this program or these programs are working and they're working differently is because each of them has a chief executive sponsor from our governing body. So there's real kind of you know uh, senior ownership of these programs. Each has a senior clinical lead. So dementia is Professor Sudhi Banerjee. Each has a program manager, but more importantly, each has a program board that is made up of stakeholders across Kent, Surrey and Sussex, across different agencies. We've got carers, patients, we've even got some students and trainees on some of the program boards. So those program boards are determining how we spend the resource that the governing body has allocated to these programs. It's small in terms of resource, but it's working and it's effective because it's set up the right way and we're spending time on it. So just to pull out a few examples, under dementia, uh, one of the one the trainee sh uh, student shadowing is actually now being noticed by Professor Alistair Burns, the national lead for dementia. And this has come uh, from the program and it is a way of um, students and trainees having the opportunity to shadow families who are looking after somebody with dementia over the course of their, of their degree um, or their, their specialty training. So they will be visiting a family three or four times a year for sort of three or four years, really understanding, having the opportunity to see how, the, uh, how dementia kind of you know, progresses, what the effects are on the family, how the carers um, are supported and so forth. So really, really important um, uh, piece of work and something that I would like to suggest we wouldn't have been able to do if we hadn't been Health Education Kent, Surrey and Sussex and come together as an integrated organisation. In terms of emergency care, this started off very much as an emergency medicine programme, um, but we've been very lucky with uh, Jeff Bryant, who's the clinical lead, and Aaron Hale, the programme lead, who have really driven this through to become an emergency care programme much wider. And again, the one I'd like to sort of just uh, point out is that, um, we've been able to support CCAM in a program to uh, develop and train call handlers, so 111 call handlers, to ensure that the decision making when they get a call is better than perhaps it, it has been. And that is being now recognised by the national uh, lead for 111 and thinking about how he can take that forward uh, to improve services on the back of that programme. Primary care is probably one of our biggest uh, programmes um, and you know, we absolutely firmly believe it has to be if we are going to make the significant shift into primary uh, care services and community services outside of hospital. We needed to do something really quite significant. Um, again, we're very lucky. We've got um, Abdul Tavabi who's driven this personally by hours and hours across the counties. Um, working with GP practices and clinical commissioning groups. And this is very exciting because if we think about our vision statement through creative partnerships as the first bit, this is the GPs working with CCGs, working with their local university and community trusts. So this is really new ways of working to determine and deliver what is it we need. And then on the back of that has come out our universities, our four universities across the county, working together on a single consistent, if you like, practice nurse development program. And I, I don't think we would have had that, you know, a year, 18 months ago. They wouldn't have been ready for that conversation. But through the good work that we've done by being integrated and multi-professional, we're having those conversations now uh, and things are starting to move. The other thing I do want to point out is the oral hygiene program um, that uh, came to us from, from Stephen uh, Lambert Humble and the dental colleagues. And again, this is something that we wouldn't have known about. We wouldn't have been able to fund. We wouldn't have sort of, you know, thought about this makes such sense if we hadn't had the opportunity through the new organisation. And that programme um, is about supporting uh, carers working in nursing homes and care homes to improve the oral hygiene of their residents, knowing that by doing that, they are obviously improving, first and foremost, the quality of life for those people, in the home, but also reducing hospital admissions because people won't get 
things such as pneumonia um, and, and cancers and things, if they have that better oral hygiene. Something you know that I, I wouldn't have, have thought about, and I'm really delighted that we've been able to um, you know, support that programme. It started in Kent, and we're now rolling it out across Surrey and Sussex. Children and young people, it's fair to say, um, most of our time has been spent on health visiting, and I've seen some Mary Teen colleagues in the room who are probably weeping as we do. Um, but, you know, we've, we've had tremendous success, and yes, we may not have quite made the target by a dozen health visitors, but when our target was 450, the biggest target in the country, I think we've done pretty well. Um, but on the back of that now, there's some really great working, and Jane Butler uh, is in the room if anybody wants to ask us some more about that, working with the uh, clinical network on children and young people. So um, starting to join up some of those pieces of, of work across other new kind of bodies uh, and seeing how we can make a difference. And obviously, as we're talking about patient safety, we have a compassion and patient safety program. It's fair to say this one probably took the longest to get off the ground because it was quite difficult to, to say what is it we need. It's very difficult to sort of articulate what, what we need to take forward. So we had a couple of stakeholder events, um, the last one in November called a Compassion Conversation, and out of that came some real actions that the governing body has now signed off. The uh, first of one, which actually isn't on there, was actually a board development day that we had a couple of weeks ago where non-execs and execs came together from providers and CCGs and looked at what should they be looking at. So one of the criticisms about Mid Staffordshire were boards were looking at information and didn't know what they were looking at. And Mid Staffordshire was an unremarkable hospital if you looked at any of the data. So that was really interesting. And what we're doing is working to say, what else can we do to help um, uh, executives, non-executives with that agenda? I also want to point out the Florence Nightingale Fellowships, because again, this is something we wouldn't have been able to do before. So we have managed to agree with the Florence Nightingale Foundation six bespoke fellowships a year for the next three years supporting these programs. And those fellowships are not just open to our nursing um, sort of colleagues, senior nursing, they're open to any senior clinician who wants to take, um, you know, take advantage of that. And they are brilliant programs. So we're about to start recruitment in the next couple of months for those. But that, again, is something that, that is very new. And, and finally, the, the whole quality improvement methodology work, working with our AHSM, but also we've been able to um, support a new academic unit for primary care research in Kent University. There's uh, other programs that are coming on. Every stream of these will have an innovation, research, and an academic element to it. So <clears throat> I wanted to just um, move on to uh, just some key messages. I'm not going to go through this because I'm a bit worried about time. I'm overrunning because we start a few minutes late. So key messages, um, I would just like to say health and social care, it's the same team, we're, we're sort of, it's the same people we should be looking at. And that we should be thinking today about funding where we need funding to be, so not just where it's historically been. Couldn't, couldn't leave without the saying that everybody says, that you know, in terms of particularly workforce planning, if we don't do something different, we're gonna keep getting those trends. However, I can probably say this, because there, there are some colleagues in the room who know I've been in the system for a few years, in, in um, Sussex particularly, but, but also at the SHA, and I can probably get away with saying that it's, it's probably worse than that, because we keep doing the same thing, and we actually think we're gonna get something different and that's the definition of insanity, but I'm probably the only person who can say that about myself. So, but it is really important because we just keep rewriting the same plans, the same guidance, and we wonder why we're just probably not hitting, hitting kind of where we need to be. And finally, just to remind us all that this is what it's about, the end of our kind of uh, vision statement, that if, if we're not doing something that impacts positively on health and well-being for all, then really we've missed the point big time. And this, this is about now moving services again out of hospitals. So again, we need to keep that in the forefront of our mind. So on that note, I'm gonna hand over to Alison, who's gonna take us through the rest of the day. Thank you very much, Philippa. Is this on? Yes. Can you all hear me at the back? Yes, okay. Um, I think that Philippa's uh, talk has set us up really well in terms of context. I think she raises some really interesting questions and indeed poses some challenges. Um, I'm going to invite Philippa back at 11, so hold your questions when we will uh, bring together the morning session uh, speakers, which will enable us to uh, do a, uh, in terms of timing and everything else. 
Um, in terms of the program, you'll see that I'm Alison Crombie. I'm Director of Education and Quality for Health Education, Kent, Surrey and Sussex. The team have put together a really interesting program. I think the, the sense of the, the, this morning's session about how we use enhanced technology as a methodology for supporting that team working and integrated uh, support for patient safety um, is going to be really a good start for us. And we finished the morning session with a, a session on clinical decision making. So I would say basically that uh, we've got a really exciting opportunity. We want you to be able to use the questions, the workshops this afternoon, but also the networking events to really just give us your thoughts and feelings. So I think it is a, a fantastic opportunity, as Philip has said, to have an organization that is finally overseeing the whole body of students and learners, which will give us collectively uh, different ways of doing things. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the morning. I'm going to um, introduce Rebecca Burden to you, who's going to give us a very brief overview, sorry, I stressed the very brief overview, um, of the uh, uh, strategy for technology. Uh, Rebecca is our program manager for Kent, Surrey and Sussex. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you, Alison, for um, that introduction. And I'm really pleased to um, be able to be here today to have the opportunity to tell you a bit about our technology-enhanced um, learning work stream and how it's developed over the last year. And also give you the chance to think about how you might use technology and what, what you're doing. Can anyone identify with this? I know I can. I think we, we've often been in that situation. I've often heard people saying, technology is great when it works. And um, I, th I think the thing we really need to think about is it's about using technology appropriately um, when we're actually trying to improve the learning experience for the learner. And, and to remember that often blended learning is the most appropriate approach. Our stakeholders told us at the end of 2012 that we actually needed to increase and enhance the use of technology for all our learners. And my role, with the help of our stakeholders, has been to um, develop and implement a five-year strategy, or begin to implement the five-year strategy, I should say, um, for using technology enhanced learning across the region. In 2013, we had the opportunity to um, look at how we were using all our learning resources and, and whether they were being used effectively um, and, and focused on patient safety. And there were some interesting findings. As Philip had described in her presentation about the uni-professional working, I think we could see that very much happening in TEL as well and probably a lot of our, our education. And what we actually found is that we had invested significantly in medical simulation equipment and building up our simulation suites, ensuring that foundation year doctors were getting their simulation training. We'd also started to use e-learning quite a bit in many of our trusts, but again that was focused on particular groups of staff rather than across the board. Some of the the things we also found was our simulation suites were underutilized and we were hearing that there wasn't sufficient fa faculty to actually deliver the simulation training that we needed across our region. And added to that, there wasn't really sufficient technical support in the, su in the simulation suites to use the technology that we'd invested in. So through our stakeholder group, We've developed a strategy for technology-enhanced learning for the next five years. And as you can see, this is very much about focusing on patient safety, making sure multi-professional learning in, and team-based learning is key to that, and about organisational collaboration. And also ensuring that technology-enhanced learning is underpinning our key priorities from the skills development strategy. We asked our stakeholders what sort of provision they'd like, what did our learners need in Kent, Surrey and Sussex. And we had an overwhelming response from our providers in terms of proposals, which was, which was really great. We've been able to 
fund a lot of those and have started to move forward with many of them. And I'd just like to give you a few examples of some of the things that we're actually working on at the moment. We've invested in a simulated ambulance, which will be a fully equipped ex-fleet ambulance with um, adult and child mannequins inside. And it'll actually travel around the region, giving all our healthcare staff the opportunity to experience scenarios in areas such as major trauma, stroke, neonatal transfers, and handovers to and from hospital staff. Among some of our video-based learning that we've invested in, we're developing a tool which includes film clips aimed at doctors, midwives, and GPs to teach them about the issues affecting patients when they lose a baby and communication skills and sensitive care. We've had a lot of parental involvement in this particular project, and the parents in some of these groups have actually expressed how, how positive they feel about in involving them in this way to increase um, training for future staff. We're also going to be increasing capacity for training our simulation trainers, ensuring that they actually reach all our professions in all our healthcare organisations and making additional resources which will actually give multi-professional scenarios to allow team-based learning and some film clips which will demonstrate good debriefing skills. The last thing I'd like to mention is that I mentioned earlier about the um, gap in the technical skills in some of our simulation suites. And this year we're going to be piloting a new apprenticeship in clinical skills and simulation, which will actually give the learners the opportunity to um, get involved in maintaining clinical skills, audiovisual equipment, and assisting with simulations. Hopefully that gives you a, a brief picture of what we've been doing for technology enhanced learning across the region. And I'd just like to link back to Philippa's presentation where she said that we really need to change our approach in how we educate our workforce and leave you with this thought. So if technology is an enabler, how will you go forward and use this to drive through the changes that we need to make in educating our workforce in this region? Rebecca, I think that leads us really well into our next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Rob Galloway, who is an uh, emergency care consultant down in Brighton, <coughs> um, but also a self-proclaimed um, enthusiast on <laughs> human factors. So Rob's going to talk us through a bit of the development of the 18 courses. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to the conference. Have I dropped that? This is a disaster so far. Yeah, it's close. Um, so have we been learning and doing the right things to enhance patient safety? Possibly not. I'd like to talk about a couple of cases where, although the knowledge was there, the patients suffered. First one, and all these three cases were cases where I'm involved with, was when I was doing intensive care as a registrar. There was a porter who was very unwell with swine flu getting increasing respiratory depression, and he needs to be intubated. There wasn't an immediate need to be intubated. He had 5, 10, 15 minutes to do it. And I was on the intensive care unit. I actually got called down to a resuscitation room for a different patient. And the anaesthetic registrar came across to do the intubation with the, the ITU SHO. The anaesthetic registrar was superb. She'd just done her FRCA. She had so much knowledge. She'd done over 1,000 intubations, never had a problem. The intensive care SHO was superb as well, just under MRCP. Again, knowledge coming out of her brains. The problem was 
that there was no system in place for how they were going to do the intubation. They'd never had a problem. Why would you need a system? There was no checklist of what to run through before you started intubation. There was no plan of what to do if they came into difficulty. But she'd done a thousand, no problems. There was no communication or specific communication with the nurses to say, if this goes wrong, can you please do this? There was no plan. So they went to intubate, and they thought they'd got in, into the trachea. But there was no CO2 monitor prearranged to be there. So they couldn't tell if they were in the right place or not. They realised only after a while that actually they'd intubated the esophagus. They started to panic. Five minutes felt like a minute. They eventually, the anaesthetic consultant came running up. After about 15 minutes of hypoxia, intubated the patient. So they had 15 minutes of hypoxia. This porter in the hospital ended up being discharged to a nursing home with very long-term hypoxic brain injury and died about three months after discharge from hospital. The intensive care unit, we got a thank you letter because we didn't really explain what happened. We didn't really go into it. But the family knew he was very unwell from swine flu and everyone did the best they could. Did what we'd learnt at medical school, did what we learnt for all our postgraduate examinations make a difference to that patient? No. We didn't get taught the basic things, the simple human factor things, which, yes, you teach it and people say, oh, you're just teaching me to suck eggs. It's easy, but we don't make it ingrained. We don't make it normalised behaviour to have human factors central to everything we do. Next one is a case that I was involved with, again, as a senior registrar. A patient came in, I, I'm an emergency doctor, and as an emergency doctor, I get very excited by high lactate levels. The patient had a lactate of seven, I just thought sepsis. I put in a central line, I was getting really excited, got the antibiotics straight away. About an hour later, we got a phone call from the laboratory. Potassium, 7.1. Oh, my God, I didn't realise. Thank God we started the treatment. The nurse said to me 20 minutes later, Rob, you knew the, blood, the potassium was 7.1 because it was on the blood gas. Why didn't you respond to it an hour ago? And I just didn't realise. I looked down it, I just didn't see it. Was it at three in the morning? I'm human, I make mistakes. But she knew about it. But she wasn't educated and empowered to speak up to me. She thought that I would have automatically known it was wrong. She had the, even though we were friends, she had the, the, the belief system that doctor knows best. She wasn't educated in the, in the correct way to challenge me, to say, what about that high potassium? Because we all make mistakes. Again, another very similar one. Again, a, just before becoming a consultant, I was running a trauma call and I was told about a very septic patient who's having chemotherapy. The nurse came to speak to me. I said, can you give 4.5 grams of tazacin, a litre of Hartman's, put them on 15 litres of oxygen and get a chest x-ray, please. I went back an hour later and they hadn't had 4.5 grams of tazacin, the most important treatment they hadn't received. And I said, why didn't you do it? You didn't ask me, she said. I was thinking, I did. But what happened? Because she just didn't hear me. And we go on about, you know, the airline industry and how we've got to learn from the airline industry for human factors. But actually, in this situation, we need to learn from the Chinese takeaway industry. Because when I order my Chinese takeaway, and I'm a very boring person, I order sweet and sour pork, Hong Kong style, egg fried rice, and cool crispy aromatic duck, 23, 38, and 74. Maybe I'm traditional, but I think that's what everyone does. And even though, when I pick up the phone, they say, hi, Rob, which maybe shows my dietary problems, they say, can I just check, you want sweet and sour pork, egg, egg fried rice, and called crispy arrow duck. And that's normal. And I think that's a good person who works in the Chinese takeaway industry. But when I ask for 4.5 grams of tazacin, a litre of Hartman's, and 15 litres of oxygen, I don't say, and can you repeat it back to me? Or I, don't, I didn't used to. So they're doing that in the Chinese takeaway industry, where it's not really important what I get to eat. But when it's life-threatening, I don't do that. And so I started doing that when I became a consultant. One of the nurses said to me, Rob, as a registrar, you're really nice. But you've come back, and you're a bit, you're a bit of a knob, really. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe. Or maybe I was a bit of a knob when I was a registrar. Because I asked her to repeat back the 4.5 grams of tazacin, and she did. She thought, knob, but the patient got 4.5 grams of tazacin. <laughs> Because what we haven't been doing is educating and ingraining human factors, making it normal. It's normal in the Chinese takeaway industry. It's normal in the airline industry. But it's not normal in medicine. 
And we've got to change what we've been doing to deliver that brilliant care that we know how we can do it. And I've picked three cases for emergency medicine because that's where I'm from. But there could be dozens. I speak to my wife as a GP who has miscommunication between the GP and discharge letters. All very simple things which could improve our patient care. So as I said, in all these cases, there was excellent staff. I hope, I, I think I'm a good, good doctor. I go to work to do the best I can. I went with the best intentions. I had passed all my exams. The other people involved, that anaesthetic registrar was superb. Also passed all appraisals, been on the annual, you know, all the stuff we've got to do for annual validation and everything. But patients suffered and staff suffered. And we often forget that. When we talk about patient safety, we also always think about patient safety. There's a secondary victim we forget about. That anaesthetic registrar that I mentioned, she was brilliant. Just done that FRCA, about to become a consultant. She got very depressed about this. She couldn't recompense or couldn't reconcile what had happened. She had two kids. She, she got into problems at home. She'd suffered. She'd given up medicine. We didn't look after her. Because as well as making it so important we look after our patients in a safe way, we also need to look after our staff. Because the way we practice medicine, our patients suffered, and so did she. Therefore, we've got to ask, has the traditional model of education strategies fail? And how can we deliver a better model? So there's a traditional model which has served us very well in the past. It served us very well when 50 years ago, it was about the, the genius doctor having to make that individual diagnosis of one of the many of the few conditions you could treat. And it worked. We spent hours understanding physiology and anatomy, understanding pathophysiology, diagnostic skills, the best teaching in traditionally where you talk about likelihood ratio so you'd really understand when you're doing your tests. And then treatment plans. We used to learn, I remember learning so much from my, even two years ago, from my, or three years ago, from my college exams, learning so many treatment protocols. And then the art of traditional medicine, communication with the patient to help make the diagnosis and about the diagnosis. But in an emergency, actually, it's all the stuff we learned at medical school with Krebs cycle. Is that, is that as important as how we communicate with our colleagues? So we've got a problem. As Philip was saying, we're taught in silos. We have medical school, we have nursing school, we go to, you know, we have our postgraduate teaching in silos. But then sometimes we get together, so like advanced life support courses, which I'm involved in. But then we teach in advanced life support everybody to be the team leader, which is just fast because we're not all team leaders. We don't teach how we work in practice. We teach as if you're an individual doctor, even though we're teaching it to a, a, a team of doctors and nurses. And then when I think about what I learned from my exams, I just regret that I didn't have Professor Google with me. Because Professor Google, it was invented 15 years or whenever, before, you know, education strategies were developed before Google. And all these things which we've learnt, a lot of it we could Google. Yes, we need a core knowledge. But the details that I revised for my exams, was that, that necessary? There's also not enough emphasis on how we make decisions. Yes, let's say we learn about how we make our diagnosis, looking at likelihood ratios and when we do tests. But what about the emotional aspects of how to make decisions when we're tired? What about the biases we, we encounter? How do we compensate for that? How do we manage our intrinsic way of thinking versus our diagnostic way of thinking? We're not taught enough about how to implement these treatments. How to actually, we know what to do, we know how to intubate, but actually how do we do it in practice? And although we spend hours and hours communicating, learning how to communicate with our patients, we're very rarely taught about how we communicate with our colleagues, even though when we look at medical error, about three quarters of medical error is based on communication problems between colleagues. And then the art of medicine. Do we do enough about looking after ourselves? Do we do enough about mindfulness and thinking, actually, how can we look after ourselves? Because only if you're well in yourself can you provide good care for your patients. I don't think in the past the traditional, med well, the traditional model of medicine was great for 50 for 20 years ago, for 10 years ago, but things have moved on so rapidly that I'm not sure that it's appropriate for now. We have to take the best of what we've got traditionally and move it forward to, the mod to modern medicine. So I want to just talk about a little bit about what we try to do in the emergency department and also why it hasn't worked so well as we'd hope and how we're trying to move it on. So we looked at some of the things we're doing in the emergency department. We looked in the resuscitation room about when we provided good care and when we didn't. We looked at qualitative research discussing with some of our, our nieces who came down, intensive care doctors, our nurses, our ODPs. We did audits, we reviewed complaints. 
and we looked at serious incidents. And we thought that the answer was crew resource management. So we, did, there's, we thought there's three areas to concentrate on, really. The environment, communication systems, and prompts and checklists. For the environment, we made it much more easy to see where things were going. We had ABCD trolleys, simple ergonomics, which is really important. For communication, we really worked on staff communication. And again, we had the Chinese takeaway model. We had S-bar, so when we're trying to get our nurses to hand over patients to us in the resuscitation room, or our junior doctors to try and ask for information, we do teach with our juniors and with the nurses about using S-bar, so situation, background, assessment, recommendation. Instead of the traditional, please present this patient, going through the history, examination, invest, you know, that's not what you need in a five minutes summary. Talk about pace communication, when you, a way of bringing up problems. So when you probe, alert, challenge, and then say emergency. So when you are, as a team leader, leading problems, your junior doctors, your nurses can say, actually, Rob, hold on, I think you're doing something wrong. A flat hierarchy. Name checks makes a massive difference. I know everybody's name in CCAN, our ambulance service, because they've got a fantastic um, badge across there. But in our trust, I've got tiny name badges, which is either in the groin area or in the chest area. And it's really embarrassing if you're trying to get someone's name. So I just forget people's names, and it just makes it not appropriate. So just simple things like that, and empowering all our staff to speak up if they feel that you're going wrong somewhere. So that's communication. And then the use of checklists. Till recently, we didn't use them. And we were in a bubble, not re realising that we weren't doing the right thing. In, you know, in the airline industry, whenever they've got a problem in a plane, they go to their flip chart, and it just tells them what to do. So then you've got the headspace to concentrate about the more important things. And we thought when we made a mistake that we were unlucky. But that's because often, as, uh, as a doctor, I admit this is true, we often think we're better than we are. We don't think we make mistakes. And there was a Christmas BMJ about five years ago which said that 96% of doctors think they're better than average. So we often don't realise when we're making mistakes. So there's, there's a, a paper or a big project looking at intubation in resusc resuscitation rooms. And this was from the National Audit Project 4. And it talked about the need for a checklist when you're doing intubation. And that's the, their summary. And so there's lots of different versions where you basically prepare the patient, you prepare the equipment, you prepare the team, you prepare for difficulty. And so you have a system in place where, although hopefully you never need to use it, you know, you never, it's not necessary, but you've just got it in case you miss something. So what do we try and do about it? We brought all these things in. We had teaching sessions, we had M&Ms, and we told the people to use the checklist. We said, you must use it. Did it make any difference? Unfortunately, just saying, please use it, even if you're polite, doesn't work. So the reality was pretty poor. Despite all the work we did, only 11% of our intubations were done with a checklist. But when we looked at sedation, we had five times more people using a, a checklist than when we were doing intubations. And why was that? Well, sedations in the emergency medicine are just done by emergency medicine teams. We were teaching our nurses and doctors together about how to, use, how to do sedations using a checklist. With intubations, it's much more complicated. You had ODPs, anaesthetists, A&E doctors, A&E nurses. And we were teaching in silos. So Simon's developed a course with us, and he was teaching the anaesthetists. I was teaching the A&E doctors, and it just wasn't working. There was no integrated teaching. The ODPs weren't coming to our A&E teaching. It just wasn't working. We need a change of emphasis and a different type of style of bringing this together. So what do we do? I say myself, Simon and many others, including ODPs and nurses, worked on this one-day course. There's loads of examples. This isn't anything special. Loads of people are doing better things than me, but this is just an example of what we've been doing locally. We looked in the morning. You know, It was a non-technical skills split into the morning and the afternoon, concentrate on patient safety and team working. And you get together and your teams of four, your A&E doctor, A&E nurse, ODP and anaesthetist, working in that team the whole day. So what do we do? I say that we had morning lectures and then afternoon simulations. In the morning lectures, we concentrated on why human factors was important, both in making a diagnosis and in actually delivering the care. And people said, oh, it's so obvious. Why do I actually need human factors? I'm not going to make a mistake. If I'm going to do an intubation, I know to check the CO2, I know to check this, if I'm going to do a transfer, I know to check that I've got an ambi bag, et cetera, et cetera. But people make obvious mistakes. Can we just go to the first video, please? Just want you to read this and see if you actually make mistakes. This is key stage one. My daughter got this right. She's seven.
How many did you get? Four. Any others? Three? Six? There's six. Who got six? So about a third of people got six. Who didn't get six? Or well, two thirds, that's a stupid question. Sorry. <laughs> I've done GCSE math, sorry. Um, so two thirds of people couldn't count the number of Fs. Now that's because you're human. We miss things. We don't always see the sat falling. We don't always see that the patient who was conscious has now become unconscious. That's why we need the team working alongside us. So if I miss the low sats, the junior doctor, the junior nurse, the ODP, the HCA can all speak up and say, Rob, you've missed the low sats because I'm human and we're all human and I can't count the Fs as well. I've done this talk so many times I still count five. <laughs> we don't speak up. Again, we talk about the psychology of it. Why didn't that nurse speak up to me? Why didn't the medic, there's a famous case of the medical student was in theatre and knew that they were taking out the wrong kidney. It's a very famous case. A patient with um, kidney cancer, the right kidney had cancer, the left kidney was fine and the surgeon started to take out the left kidney. And all she said was, are you sure? And the consultant shut her up, or whatever, I don't know, story in detail. But proceed, she didn't feel confident to speak up and that patient ended up dying or going on to dialysis and then dying. Is it normal to not speak up? Well, yes, it is. Just if we can go to the second clip, please. It is normal. And so we show people it's normal, so they realise that they have to positively make a difference. So we can see, although that's just on line lengths, people go to the social norm. They don't want to speak out. And especially if there's such a hierarchy between an HCA and a consultant, you're not going to speak out. So we need to show that actually it is normal human intuition to not want to speak out. It is normal human behaviour. And we've got to make people realise that they, that is normal and they've got to do the abnormal. And then in terms of errors and fixation errors, we talk about making how, how we make diagnosis errors because we have biases, and how we go down the wrong route because we don't notice things. Or we're so fixated on a problem that we can't think of it's, there's another solution. For example, a patient who's getting persistently hypertensive in intensive care, we think it's because of pain to increase the analgesia, when it could just be that we've got the inotropes are being pumped too quickly. And we look at fixation errors, but the whole point is we don't want to try and use medical examples the whole time because there's a much better fixation example um, of fixation errors, please. Next video, please. That may be a non-medical example, but it's the same when we persistently say, oh, that low sats is just a poor reading. Who's done that? Looked at the low sats and said, oh, it's a saturation monitor, as opposed to the patient's dying. We get these fixations. So in the morning, 
We talk about human factors. Three hours about why human factors is so vital. And although we've been doing it for acute situations, we're developing it into a course. In July, we're, talking, we're doing a similar talk for the GPs and a different, similar workshop for GPs about why human factors is so important in the GP practice. And I say, these, fa these examples, because it's me based in emergency medicine, but they're similar pre-hospital, similar in GP and other realms of secondary, med um, secondary care. So let's say the afternoon is simulation, and you've got to talk next about simulation, so I won't go into that. But what we do is we do it in teams, the teams you do it. Because one of the problems with traditional simulation courses is like when you're doing ATLS, everybody is the team leader. But that's not reality. We need to simulate as we work. So has it made any difference at all? Well, there's a few ways of how you can tell if a course or change of emphasis has worked. There's a tr traditional evaluation of a course, which doesn't really tell you much. Then, does it use, is it used in working practice? Then, audit of use of checklists, then, then clinical case examples. So, course evaluation. Well, they filled in a form in front of me, and I said, can I have your feedback form? And they said, yes, it's lovely. That means nothing. Does it get used in practice? Well, we've gone back six months after and asked people, and 98% of people were using it six months after. And they're using the human factors multiple times a day. So, now when I say, are you ready to receive information to the nurses? And can you repeat back what I say? They don't think, no, they think, that's right, well done. <laughs> so, is it actually used in practice? This was from a year ago, and the data is much better. We just finished the um, audit last week. We got up to 31%, and then we, a bit of a, a, a um, it was getting improving, and then we, we didn't do as much education. We've increased it again. The last six months, we're now up to, Checklist used for intubations at about 80%. And I know when I was looking at the data that one of the problems was with people talking about checklists, oh, we were stuck at 30% and we looked at why. One of the reasons was we had a tick box for every single thing that had to go into the notes. People just got fed up with that. But actually you don't need any of that. You just need a laminated chart and there's a document in the notes, checklist used, tick. So I was going back through some of the ones which weren't done. And I was involved in them. I realised actually some of that is because I didn't actually document it. So although we're only up to 80%, it may be due to poor documentation. But that was before we changed the way of the, so it's education, but also changing the process. And the effect on patient outcome. It's really difficult in A&E to see the effect of patient outcome. Most of the human factors work is done on, in elective work, in theatre, because it's very, very easy. You come in very well in elective work. You have your operation, you should go home very, very well. But in emergency situations, and also when GPs are referring to the hospital and, and more chronic situations, it's very hard to see the effects of human factors. Because especially in A&E, if you come in, you're coming in really unwell, and you're going to go out of A&E to intensive care or to a ward unwell. And it's hard to know our impact. So it's just some cases which make a difference. We did, this is, I was doing nights on Sunday, and we had three cases. One, we did intubation. And we hadn't, we went, went through everything. We realised we wouldn't have a CO2 monitor. So we went and got the CO2 monitor before the start of intubation. Then we went to intubate. There was difficulty intubating. The first thing which picked it up was a lack of capnography. It made a difference. Next one was uh, on Sunday night, did a shoulder x-ray for trauma. My SHO was looking at it and said, Rob, what about that pneumothorax? And I'd missed it. And I was so pleased that she'd gone on our course and felt empowered to speak up. And the final one, was out, is it, I was doing a trauma call and our nurse took information from the out of hours GP because I handed over the phone. And I heard her say, can I just repeat back the information to you about the drugs this patient was on? And then the GP responded, no, they're also on warfarin. And she wrote that down and told me. And we did this Chinese takeaway style communication. So when the patient came in and I knew she'd had a head injury and was confused, because she was on warfarin, I did a CT scan straight away. So three examples in one night of how we're making a difference. So I say, Human factors are becoming, things have changed, it's becoming part of the syllabus. It's much more common. We've got an increasing understanding of importance of staff resilience and mindfulness as well as human factors make a difference into what we do. We're changing things, but we've got a long way to go. This is how we adopt things. Have I got time for another video? Or not? No. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so, we are changing things, but there is so much more to do. We've got to get the best traditional medicine Mix it in with a modern way of working. Getting the importance of human factors in diagnosis and treatment. Getting the MDT to learn together and work together. Embrace learning from our mistakes and teaching how to look after ourselves. When we go back to the future, 
We need to look at the past. We need to get interest in this. Only by getting interest in this will we start to make a difference to our patients' safety. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rob. Sorry to cut off the last video. Um, I think you'll agree that uh, Rob is always very in entertaining and uh, stimulating as opposed to simulating. Um, and I think in terms of the questions that you will have, just hang on to them because 11 o'clock we're hoping to get the panel together again. But it's uh, uh, with pleasure that I introduce uh, Professor Laxendale, who is uh, the president. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've got a card here, so I'll read it out in terms of the Association of Simulation and sits on the National Strategy Group for HEE. So we're really delighted to have Brim with us. Um, I'll leave it to you, Brim. Um, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Alison, and to everyone on for inviting me here. It feels, uh, it feels a bit like standing up to thank the ushers after the best man has just done a brilliant speech. <laughs> um, so forgive me, and uh, I've not been brave enough to put videos in because Rob took them all. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, um, the invitation today was to come and sort of pitch uh, to you roughly where I see sort of simulation fitting in to the future and uh, where are we going with simulation or in the patient safety agenda? Where does that fit into our sort of endeavors from an educational perspective, workforce development perspective, and responding to this terrain, which um, Philippa has already sort of spoken to and the challenges that that offers, provides us, the opportunities it gives us, depends on which way you want to look at that. Um, because actually it's, it's tough. You know, there's a lot of people watching what we're doing, how we're responding to this, and depending on who you are, your perspective on this will be pretty focused on uh, certain aspects of how we respond, how we lead the, the future development around education and training, workforce development, uh, and what we do to actually work together to try and achieve some goals, which I think if we if we don't work together, uh, I think we're going to struggle to achieve what we probably have within our grasp. And so let's have a look at that. Rob has already started to introduce this theme, one of the sort of uh, emerging sort of shifts in our attention for education and training, looking at how we integrate human factors, the science of human factors and its applications into our healthcare systems into the way that we work, how our work is designed and put together, how we educate and train the current workforce and our future workforce in these aspects alongside the many parts of education and training which will remain fundamentally important. And so it's, you know, it feels like something else we've got to squeeze in. Um, and it shouldn't <coughs> feel like that. It's actually got to be, well, this has to integrate in alongside some of the other stuff we do, which is equally important. Um, and I think I'll, I'll come back to that slide a bit later on. Simulation, I'm going to mention it, but not in detail. Um, I put this slide up really just as a reminder to the audience. I think uh, uh, there's a great assumption for if you're sort of heavily involved in simulation and its many sort of uh, varieties. Um, that you forget that actually not everyone perhaps has got such a, a broad view of what it represents. People will tend to have a mental model in their head about what simulation means. So in respect of this talk, in respect of what ASPI does, where you see simulation, I remind you that it is a pretty broad church. It ranges from aspects of screen top workshops, tabletop exercises, right through to use of simulated patients and live patients even, through to more sophisticated technologies. Um, and it's a, it's a broad church. Um, I think what it also represents is classically quite a disruptive technology. So I think over the past years, it has started to shift our thinking in terms of the use of simulation to support education and training in our workforce, what it can offer us. I think it's dynamic in that actually the technologies that are being developed are growing ever apace. 
the ways in which we can use simulation, even from the simplest forms through to the more sophisticated, our understanding of that is growing and maturing all of the time. And I think it has a unique opportunity to meet the, the changing demands of what we require of our current and future workforce, of how we use it to improve the systems of care in which we work. And so I think it's um, fundamental that uh, we sort of look at it very, very carefully. Rob's touched on a bit of this, actually. We've spent, you know, we traditionally we've had quite a focus on developing individuals to be professionals, to be capable members of the workforce within whatever the setting of, of care that they're providing. And that we have got that mental model of, you know, if you speak to medical students, Traditionally, they are incredibly focused on how they are going to cope when they qualify and about what skills they will have. They do not want to be the one that makes a mistake. And the similar will be true for many other members of the professional team, I've no doubt. But it's actually, well, how do we bring in, how do we build on some of the topics which Rob introduced around some of the non-technical skills? Classically, you know, the, the soft skills soft skills which are so hard to do they are now appearing within curricula it's great to see that uh, I think our ability to teach them to observe them to give feedback on them is probably still lagging behind a little bit I think some groups are better at it than others um, but actually the language that we use to do that the way in which we do it which is formative for our colleagues rather than appearing critical of their abilities is quite important for us to think about. Um, and those of us involved in simulation and use of simulation in team-based uh, sort of uh, exercises will be quite used to the complexities of trying to debrief teams and debrief them well and constructively and actually the opportunities to develop those skills which actually we should be using in practice all the time. And you realize, well, we've not necessarily spent much time focusing on that. So then simulation then underpinning some of these groups, some of the team-based processes, team skills and team behaviors, and how that underpins, well, at the moment, those outcomes there are driven around the performance of the individual and team. But the next one on would be how that impacts on the quality of care provided for our patients. So do we actually invest a great deal of time and attention in developing teams, in understanding what it's like to be in a team, what an effective team looks like, what are those skills and behaviors, the application of some of those cognitive aids, the tools that Rob talked about in terms of checklists. Uh, many of you in practice will read of the issues that are created when trying to introduce a checklist. I my background is anaesthetics, and so I see quite a bit of surgical, safe surgical care, the themes of work there. And I, had a, uh, I heard a, a beautiful analogy from a surgical colleague recently talking at a conference when uh, he was taught we were debating what the most important factor was in safe surgery. And he was, tr he was, he was having to defend the fact that the surgeon is the most important factor. But he, he gave a very balanced view, actually. It's remarkable. Anyway. Um, <laughs> But uh, he, he likened the way that the safe surgery checklist had been introduced, i.e. sort of dropped in to say, in two months, this is mandatory. And uh, he likened it to uh, getting a spade, throwing it into your allotment, and then coming back six months later expecting to reap the rewards of a great vegetable harvest. <laughs> and uh, I thought, actually, that's quite a neat analogy because we didn't really think very much about, well, what does it take to support such a tool being embedded? What has to go on within that team, within that professional setting, to really make use of some of these tools, which actually have a great deal of common sense and even evidence behind them, but actually, well, we're not very good at accepting some evidence. We do like to challenge it. It's quite right that we challenge some things, but, well, we do like... Uh, well, we do like a good fight, don't we? We don't make it easy. So simulation, well, it works there. So potential for simulation then is, well, you can actually explore these things. You can explore it safely. You can do it in a way which actually 
you can create different circumstances according to your setting, your whatever the requirements are, the changing needs of your system, and you can have that educational perspective of it being a tool to try and improve the people, the teams, the staff, their portable skills, their portable non-technical skills to work in teams if they're not used to working in a regular team. You can use it like that. You can use it as a probe. Uh, that was the only picture I could find of a probe. Well, I can find other pictures as well, but I didn't think I could put them up. Um, <laughs> the, um, so that's like, you know, some, on some planet somewhere. Um, but actually, you can use it as a probe into the system. So you can use simulation as a tool to investigate what happens when people are in practice? What happens if we're trying to introduce new guidelines, new ways of working? What happens if you try and bring in a new piece of equipment? If actually, well, we don't quite know how it works. Rather than just, well, that seems like a good piece of kit, we'll bring it in. So it's got two sides to it, I think, simulation. And it speaks to this piece here of actually translating where we are on looking at the curricula and about developing sort of knowledge, skills, behaviours within individuals, but understanding a bit more about, well, what is it that helps translate that into what we see in workplace practice around individual capabilities, developing professional expertise, looking at, well, what is it to develop teams and leadership skills within teams? What does that mean? What does that look like? Actually, how do we use simulation and the people who benefit from it to actually improve organisational learning and be part of that fundamentally important aspect of underpinning professionalism in practice, thinking about how we slowly change culture. I hear quite a bit around culture in the NHS. It's a bit like banking, you know, apparently the culture in banking has got to change. And the culture in the NHS has got to change as well. Don't think it has to change in politics, apparently, but it does for <laughs> us. So there we are. You can cut that bit out, can't you? Right. Yeah. Uh, so, the, uh, so this is a bit in Nottingham. Well, this is sort of just to give you a picture of, you know, we've run a centre in Nottingham for 10 years. This is an array of the sort of things that we're involved in that we can contribute to, are contributing to, and it starts at, um, I'll use this one, it's a bit better, lower down around the individual and the staff and the workforce, and this is... You can't see it, but you'll get a copy of these, I guess, but actually some pictures of how we're bringing in supporting human factors into our workforce education, into the students, into the, the staff who work with us. How we use simulation to actually probe and look at, uh, analyse incidents when things haven't gone right, and actually translate that into educational programmes. Simulation in situ going to the workplace and testing out their system if they want to change it. How we use simulation within quality improvement programs in different ways to try and rapid change systems and actually look at in more depth within research programs or even at individual sort of scholarship type development around the skills of the people developing this type of technology. So there you are, part one, simulation, broad spectrum in terms of what its future is really uh, speaking to the patient safety agenda, whether that's around the staff, the workforce, the teams, or looking at how we look at systems and address organisational learning, contribute to changes in culture. The bit I'm going to go on to now then is actually, well, how do we create the conditions for this? How do we start to try and work together a bit more collaboratively? Because one of the things that we're well aware of is that actually um, we haven't really got a clue what everyone else is up to. And there's a great many enthusiasts. You know, I suspect you're hearing about the networking you're developing here. You've started to find out what's going on. You're developing a shared agenda. But actually, how many times do you find out about things when you've been working on something and you happen to go to a meeting and someone else says, oh, yeah, someone else has done that. Yeah. Oh, well, we could have told you that you were going to run into trouble with that. You're thinking, oh, right, thanks very much. Oh, I mean, six months of my life gone then. Yeah, <laughs> great. I'll, I'll go and have another shandy. Right, so here's some work then. Let's just let's describe to you now the terrain of actually what's been going on um, at a sort of a more strategic level around trying to get a picture of what's going on, trying to scope what's been going on. And it's great to see um, some Ian Curran uh, in the audience who's 
been involved um, uh, at a you know instrumental level in much of this work, so it's lovely to see him here. So 2010, whoops, 2010, um, Department of Health um, sort of decided actually, uh, well, we need to have a picture of what's going on with simulation and sort of new learning technologies. Um, we don't know what's going on. Uh, we need to find out more. And they commissioned a report which is termed the Inventures Report, uh, which started to scope out practice about what is happening, what's happening across uh, England and Wales at least. Um, in terms of simulation, where is it going? It um, get a picture of what's happening. It gave a picture, um, and from that, this diagram appeared as part of the, a framework for technology-enhanced learning, which some of you, I'm sure, will, will be familiar with. You've seen it, um, which actually um, provided quite a, a helpful sort of um, pictorial representation of how learning technologies, which included simulation, would underpin uh, this sort of link between educational outcome and clinical outcome, uh, so patient at the center around patient outcome safety, and then a number of principles around that, all of which had a series of recommendations underneath it about actually, well, what good practice should look like in terms of designing, introducing, integrating uh, education. You could apply this to a range of things, I'm sure. Um, at, at the time, uh, there, was a, there was an election, um, so it didn't become a strategy, it stayed as a framework. Um, so funnily enough, that meant uh, that there was no money <laughs> to deliver it. So actually, it, it sort of um, parked itself a little bit whilst we got used to the new uh, political territory. And, uh, and then it's been picked up again now. And actually, what we're doing now is some work with um, both the Higher Education Academy and Health Education England to rescope this, to say, well, actually, well, what is going on? What has changed um, in the few years since the Inventures Report has done? Because we know it's a rapidly changing terrain that we're talking about here. Um, perhaps can we start to collect some evidence about, well, what good practice looks like around that, around that framework? And so um, ASPE and Higher Education Academy started it, but it now fits under the, 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 the TEL work stream of HEE as well, which I'll come on to. We started where we wanted to actually get a, a try and push for as comprehensive a, as possible a picture of current practice to lean into both higher education sector as well as NHS sectors to look across the professions and organisations just to get a picture of actually, well, what is going on actually is this going to be helpful in terms of us understanding where the gaps are? What do we need to address? Actually, what is happening around resources, around equity of access, around sharing resources, about educational coherence, integration into curriculum? What is happening about the skills of the people supporting this work? Because the simulation piece is slightly different from a lot of the other mobile or e-learning technologies in that actually there's quite a bit more organisation that needs to be done with it. The, the team, the faculty, the administrators who are helping support it, it's a little bit more complex than something which can just simply stand alone. Would we get to picture of that curriculum integration? Where were the real barriers? How could we start to articulate any solutions that have been found that could be shared more widely? And of course, as soon as you start going into this, you start to uh, um, uh, quickly get... Uh, caught up in this sort of spider's web of actually, oh, there's a lot of people involved. And there's a lot of people involved all with bits of the picture. Not many have the opportunity, perhaps, to get that bigger picture. So actually, who do we go in and ask about what's going on in your patch? Uh, do we ask, you know, this is where we are. We've been trying to get to the right people about looking at, well, in terms of the faculty, let's say, in terms of the educators who are making use of this resource, we've questionnaire has gone out. Some of you will have seen it. Many more of you will um, because it's still live. But about actually, how do you make use of simulation in your educational practice? Actually, what support have you got within your role to do that? What preparation have you had to enable you to do it? What is your professional development look like? How is your work in this field actually recognized by your employer? And actually, surprise, surprise, 
There's quite a wide range of picture here about what that looks like. In terms of the administration and leadership in a local and an institutional level as well, similar questions actually. Well, how is it put together? What is the commissioning model behind your work? What does it look like? Surprise, surprise. A massively heterogeneous picture is, is appearing. And that's just where we've got data back on hopefully we'll add to it. But actually the funding models, then the business plans, well, the curriculum pieces, you know, the people, you guys who are involved in quality assurance and monitoring this and the quality of this, actually, what does that look like? Do you feel suitably skilled? You've got, you've got the right questions to ask. Do you want to be able to explore and do something meaningful and formative for the people doing it? It doesn't need to be a stick. It needs to say, well, actually, well, okay, how do we channel work to say, this is what we think we should be doing. It was great to hear some of the, some of the work that's already underway here. So we're building up this network map. We're understanding a bit more about some of the relationships in different geographical areas between different professional groups. Um, we know that there are some geographical areas, some groups underrepresented. So we've got a few more months to run this to try and add to that. So there will be some more focused work going on in the next uh, month or two, um, which we hope will coordinate through representatives here for this region um, and similarly in other areas. This is where it needs to go in terms of, well, how do we actually build up the evidence gap? Everyone will say, well, where's the evidence? Well, look at the heterogeneity of how we're delivering it. How are we going to possibly create evidence? It really is about putting small bits of the jigsaw together here and fitting them together. What would excellence look like in terms of how we commission this work? How do we, where do we put our resources? What should that look like? How do we share that? How do we get away from the fact that there's quite a lot of equipment sitting in cupboards used once a month because people won't get it out and share their toys because they're scared it might get broken or perhaps they're not actually sure how it really works anyway? How much of that is going on? How do we break that down? How do we get that collaboration going? So the collaboration bit, well, sharing, right? So the last few minutes now is about actually what we're doing, who we're speaking to, where you can find out more. We can hopefully reach out to you. So a lot of it is around personal contacts, isn't it? But actually the changing terrain about commissioning <coughs> opportunities such as today, your existing networks around strategically and operationally about how this is working for you, fundamentally important. I think understanding sometimes some groups have a different understanding about how the link exists between postgraduate training and workforce development and we see well, some perhaps are, are not terribly literate at actually having a shared picture of there uh, and actually where simulation fits in where other learning technologies fit in so we're exploring that we're trying to work with that this is the national project uh, under HEE around technology enhanced learning. So if you, you can search on their website and actually find out a bit more about that, that's a national project which is going on now to try and see whether we can develop a resource which can give you access to a massively wide variety of resources, educational resources that have been developed across the UK, many of which could be freely available, most of which you, I, know nothing about some of which will be really, really good. Well, why not? Why don't we go and look for them and make use of them rather than try and invent our own? So there's this project going on to explore that, to try and create such a, a portal. Okay, social media. Use of social media, both as an educational platform as well as a way of sharing information. I will hesitate to have a competition about how many of you could name the many different ways in which the kids uh, <laughs> communicated, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think I've, I've got three of them. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of the audience, but actually, well, you see it internationally, don't you? Fundamentally, are we smart about making use of this as a means of communicating, sharing information, developing knowledge. Aspie, you know, I'll get my chance to have a quick plug. 
This is who we are. Association for Simulated Practice in Healthcare. So uh, a UK-wide membership organisation, but actually the learned body really around simulation. M membership, multi-professional, higher education as well as NHS practice, but with, with people who are genuinely interested in many different applications or developments of simulation and new learning technologies, both within professional specialty groups, but also cutting across. And I think when we get together, when we meet, uh, a fantastic opportunity, really, just to find out what else is going on. Never ceases to surprise me. Never ceases to surprise me when we have our meetings about the stuff that's going on. This is one of the outcomes that we've achieved recently, which is uh, a new peer-reviewed international journal, which will appear later on this year, specifically around this theme in healthcare. Um, and which uh, we hope to uh, engage people with. That's the email -y bit at the bottom. If you want to register your interest to find out and hear about it as it becomes more real. So please do, if you're interested, um, send in a, an email and uh, put yourself on the, on the list to be informed about that as it moves forward. So my final piece then is this, actually. Well, where next? I think it's, it's what do we do to drive to support this move from having a collection of people with common interests through to developing communities of practice into truly collaborative networks and a collaborative network which may be geographically bound or may be bound across different professions or different purposes. What do we do? We have got to that, they, you know, that map slightly thing, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of holes in that. You can't quite see them. I didn't put them in. So we've got some more work to do to build up that map, to build up the understanding of the relationships, to understand, create um, an avenue to find out what is happening, what new developments are on the horizon across that terrain, to engage the many groups, to think about, well, actually, how and where do we make sure that the public patients are represented in this, as well as the commissioners of care, who've also got quite a strong interest in safety and quality. How do they fit in? Where do they engage with this? So finishing on human factors then, Rob mentioned it a few times. Those of you, some of you may be more familiar with that term than others, but actually human factors, the, uh, the clinical human factors group has got a website um, that uh, has got some great resources on it for those of you who want to read a bit more about it. There's a good piece at the moment about where it fits into leadership development and to organizational development, but you can see the human factors science fits in along a great many areas of interest to us all, both in terms of how healthcare systems are designed, how they are funded, supported, how they perform, how we perform within those systems, within the teams. Um, Jane Carthy helped author this, um, very kind, she put simulation on it, I rewrote it. Uh, so I think, well, where does simulation fit in? <laughs> this, might, this might just be one perspective. but No, but I think simulation actually has or could have a role in many of those areas to explore, well, how do we improve? How do we know what things look like at the moment? How do we help improve people's understanding? How do we test out cha changes, if we're going to suggest them, before we do it, and then see what happens. I've added something there around revalidation. I think that'll be of interest to some at some point. So place of simulation, that's where it sits. Uh, that's uh, get in touch with me if you want to. This is when we meet in Nottingham. Uh, it will be quite heavily centered around the human factors piece. So um, hopefully we may see some of you there. And that is uh, my Twitter name. For those of you that are that way inclined. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In fact, um, Bryn, I'll ask you to stay here because I'm going to invite the panel back. Um, and in fact, we've got um, half an hour for questions. And I think we'll see how that time goes. But it actually does provide us with a real opportunity for you to think about um, don't fall up the steps, Philippa. Um, what you might want to ask. Could I ask if you're going to ask a question that you introduce yourself and you indicate who you'd like 
to ask the question of. Otherwise, we do a lot of who should we direct that to. Have we got everybody? Okay. Have we got a, uh, have you got a mic? Yeah. Okay, I'll try and do the roving room. Um, and it's always very tempting to, to ask people who you know the name of. So I'm going to ask David to start us off. I'm David Yates. I'm, yeah, I'm David Yates. I'm Associate Dean for Quality. Uh, my question's uh, aimed at Robin Bryn. Uh, I'm possibly just trying to justify myself only seeing three Fs in your uh, it seemed to bleed and obvious. Uh, my question is that the, your work is sort of going down linear lines. And I was wondering what you thought of the place of heuristics, which is more pattern recognition, making quick decisions, the importance of it. Because it seems to me that you're perhaps it's traditionally a strong part of medicine. And perhaps what you're working towards is something which is downplaying the importance of heuristics, which I think are a double-edged sword. But I'd be interested in your views. Um, uh, so, uh, okay, I, c I can appreciate that perspective completely. Um, I think you're right. I think that does play an important part in um, both sort of diagnostic and therapeutic process that many of us have grown up with, have uh, become familiar with. However, I would also say that it uh, also underpins some of our failures uh, because actually we get very quick to recognize patterns. Um, and unfortunately, some of the patterns we recognize, I think Rob articulated perhaps one or two, uh, we miss the point. So I think experts are as fallible as the most novice person in the team. Unfortunately, it's a difficult thing to find palatable, but it is. Um, and so I think we need to have an awareness of, I'm not saying actually it's the wrong thing to do, but I think doing that, performing at that level with a greater awareness of the fact that actually we need to just sense check that we're on the right path and that we need to enable others who will see the other Fs that we haven't seen, that they can actually raise that and bring it to our attention. And that we need to enable that to happen because actually no matter how nice I think I am, uh, the person I'm working with um, may be pretty anxious about doing that. So I think it's both, actually, yeah. Just Just Rob. I think I've got a mic on. Um, in terms of the question about diag uh, using our intuition di diagnostics, <coughs> we make diagnosis in two ways. One, using our intuition, that's incredibly important. And then there's also when we think about it in more detail. And we have to use both systems um, because, especially when we're in time-critical situations, using our pattern recognition is important. But as Brim was saying, often we do get that pattern recognition wrong. We often get that pattern recognition wrong at three in the morning. We're not always at our very, very best. And by being able to have a system where all your team can collaborate into that pattern recognition and say, actually, wh what about that other F? We hopefully will get to a better diagnosis. But in terms of making diagnosis, I think we need to really look at how we teach diagnostic skills because I remember doing statistics at medical school and I learned about um, student t-test, p-values, all that very useful stuff, but no one actually talked about likelihood ratios and the importance of Bayesian theory of medicine, starting with your pre-test probability of a diagnosis, doing a test and then applying it to a post-test probability. So remember we had about three weeks ago, our new, um, well, not three weeks ago, um, about three months ago, one of our new F2s, a high pre-test probability patient with ischemic heart disease wanted to send home someone with a negative troponin after speaking to the medical registrar. But that's because they didn't put the high pre-test probability with a likelihood ratio together to still come up with a high post-test probability. And so I think we need to get our intuition and um, pattern recognition skills, but also improve them with the, when we stand back a bit and think about it in a more detailed way. There's a place for both, absolutely. Thanks, Rob. Dave? Uh, this question is for Rob uh, and Wesley from the uh, Brighton Sussex Medical School. Um, I would take, uh, take some argument with your definition of intuition because I think intuition is based on some degree of learnt behaviour from prior experience. The problem is we don't often vocalise it uh, and it may be that you will recognise things in a situation that perhaps one of your juniors won't and you may take time to actually vocalise it. But my main question was I just, I'm interested in your study on the A-teams looking at system-based error and individual errors, 
how are you going to transfer that into the primary care setting where essentially most work is individually based and it's not team based? There's a number of factors such as with communication. And we used an example where the, an out of house GP was trying to hand over someone, she'd gone to see them in a nursing home and was handing over to our nurse because I couldn't take the phone call at the time. And it was about that two way communication of, and Chinese takeaway style where we actually. Um, our nurse hadn't taken all the information, but only feeding it back did the GP realise they hadn't got all the information. So there's individual things you can do, but also you say the GPs are indivi working individually. I disagree. They're working with their nursing, um, their practice nurses, their people they refer to, the district nurses. I actually think that although the examples I've used is often um, secondary care, it's just as valid getting the human factors into primary care because across all specialties, across, and I think the division between primary and secondary care. Has to, be, has to leave, it's got to be one continuum of care. It's communication of human factors is most often the cause of errors, not knowledge. And so I think it is equally applicable to the general practice setting. Now, different emphasis, yes, of course, I'm looking at my situation, at the emergency situations, but I do think there's other ways you can look at it from the primary care point of view, and it's equally important. Is there anything to add to that in terms of what's going on nationally outside of the acute sector? Um, from a, uh, I, th I think it's fair to say that uh, our experience with how simulation is used, how that perhaps fits in with supporting education and training outside the hospital sector, I think is, I'm not going to say, I'm going to say further behind in general practice. I don't think that's, that's the right phrase. I think it's modelled differently, I think, within general practice there's a much heavier emphasis on the use of simulated patients and perhaps patient experts. It, there's a vast um, wealth of experience around communication at that level between um, the, the patient doctor consultation, um, probably much of which you know, we could learn from in, in secondary care in hospital-based practice. Um, but I'm not sure quite how much is done around at the individual practitioner level about dealing with ambiguity and making decisions based on incomplete information. I'm not sure you know, we know of all of the problems with the fact that actually shared decision making and information sharing electronically, IT, between different sectors of the healthcare can impact on the safety and quality of care we provide. And I'm not quite sure where, where that fits in alongside the, the work at the individual practitioner level about having a, a sight of that, I guess. Sorry, I really thank you very much for that. We've got a question here. While we're waiting for the microphone, could I just ask something around the fact that I think in